The following content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Hello and welcome everyone to Always Another Way podcast. My name is Marina Sprocky Spriggs, and I have a master's in professional counseling. I'm the Ippy Award-winning author of Stop Looking for a Husband, Find the Love of Your Life, and Nasty Divorce, A Kid's Eye View. I write positive divorce advice for the Huff Post, and I'm trained in clinical hypnosis. And this podcast is for out-of-the-box thinkers, and it's for those who hear the call of hope in always another way. And if you're very rigid and set in your beliefs, this is probably not your cup of tea. However, you should note, taste can and do change. And I am super excited for the show today. Um, Always Another Way is about doing things another way. Meaning, if you haven't tried it, there's an option, there's your other way. And also I believe if you haven't tried it, you really can't speak from experience, so. Don't knock it until you try it. And in the world of healing and knowing that in this particular country, we have a pharmaceutical lobby that spends a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money influencing research studies and our government. And as you know, just like when somebody wants to sell you something, if they've got a vested interest in making money, you don't know really Do they have your best interest in mind or not? Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I mean, because everybody does have to make money. So there's kind of a fine line there. And what I've found in my personal journey and with many, many people that I know, that there is not just one way to do things. And by no way do I knock modern medicine because it is amazing in so many ways. And especially trauma, you get hit by a car, go right to the emergency room and let them take care of you. But there are a lot of other things that you don't need to run to a doctor for. And maybe there's somebody else that doesn't have an MD by their name that knows a lot and can really help you. So I am going to bring on my guest, James Michael McCoy. He is an adventurer, filmmaker, gardener, and naturalist. He's a fourth generation Texan who grew up exploring the rolling hills of Western Jack County in North Central Texas. It's a place where the Comanches used to roam. He was raised on a farm and learned to garden and take care of livestock. And without his parents knowing, he watched Apocalypse Now at the age of seven, woo, heavy film for seven, (laughs) and fell in love with the cinema. McCoy attended school in the tiny town of Bryson with a graduating class of 12 where he found inspiration in the novelist Larry McMurdy, who lived nearby in Archer City, where the last picture show was filmed. Reading McMurdy books helped him dream beyond the pastures and oil patches of Jack County. He graduated from Texas State University with a business degree and went to work in the corporate world as a professional salesman for several years. McCoy taught himself to write screenplays and eventually networked his way into various independent film projects in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. That's a nice, another way too. And in 2015, McCoy met journalist and writer Peter Gorman. Within a year, he began filming More Joy, Less Pain. It's a documentary that chronicles Peter's family life in Texas and his travels to Peru for the past 35 years. This is McCoy's first feature film, and he's already in development on his next documentary on High Times Magazine. He currently lives in Arlington, Texas. And welcome to the show, James Michael. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Thank you for... Let me be here. Awesome. Well, I am so excited. And, you know, as we kind of dive in to this, maybe we should tell people who is Peter Gorman and then also, you know, how did you find him and what made you choose him for this? 
Yeah, um, Peter Gorman is a, is a character like unlike anyone I've ever met in my life, and and I knew it the first time um, I was I went to his house. I, I just emailed him out of the blue and said, Peter, I'm just coming to your house. I'd read his book a couple of years before, and in the book I really, in, in the back it says lives in Joshua, Texas, and I'm like Joshua, Texas. I mean that's like south of Fort Worth. I mean this guy is a New Yorker. What's he doing here? Right. You know, and it took me a couple of years before I got up the courage to finally email him, just say I'm going to your house and. Literally, it was after that first meeting that I knew, I was like, there's a, there's a movie here. I can't believe somebody hasn't already made a documentary. I've never made a documentary. I had no real aspirations to make a documentary, but I just knew that I had to document this man and this man's knowledge of what he's learned going to Peru for 35 years. Nice. So what was it like? What, what types of things does he do? You know? Well, uh, you know, he started out, in New York, he's got such a really, you know, varied life of, of careers of what he's done because he was a cab driver in New York City and then he became a professional chef. And through that, you know, he was writing and he became a writer for a High Times magazine. He'd actually went to the jungle and wrote a story about ayahuasca. Um, I don't know, maybe we should, I know you talked a lot about your last episode about what ayahuasca uh, is and was, but for people who have it, uh, heard of it before or know what it is, it's a, it's a brew that they make in the Amazon that's used as a healing medicine. And Peter had went down there and high times and picked up his story. And next thing you know, he's working for him and he's writing about medical marijuana in 1986 when no one else was. Right. And then, you know, he first went to Peru in 1984, I believe. And then from there, every, you know, every year almost he went back and kept going back and kept learning. And then he met his teacher, Julio Arena, who we talk about in the documentary. And that's where Peter learned a lot of this knowledge, where he learned about Una de Gato, Cat's Claw, and he learned about Sapo, and he learned about ayahuasca, Nunu, and all these medicines as all his teachers. He had several teachers over the years, and and he's a journalist, so he's documenting this stuff. And and I knew through the film, I was like, I'm not a journalist. I how do I can I document this? Just start filming. And I didn't have any money to hire a film crew, and I, I didn't have any major investors that were interested in in helping me do that. So I just said, let's just do it. You know, this is. You know, my whole life's been, uh, you know, just instinct and following it. And it was just telling me just just find a way to get to Peru. I think when I first met Peter Gorman, I literally had like $100 to my name. Wow. I'd lived kind of out in the woods for three years getting sober. I was an alcoholic for 17 years. And that's when these first these medicines, these uh, psychedelic medicines started coming in my life. And through psilocybin, I was, you know, not a huge dose or anything, a couple of grams of psilocybin cured 17 years of alcoholism. Wow. I mean, and there you go. Right. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Through that, through other things, I, I came into contact with, with ayahuasca even before I met Peter Gorman. And then after knowing about his trip and finding out about his trip and then going to the heart of where this medicine comes from, I was like, let's do this. Let's try to find a way to make this dream a reality. That's amazing. So you're like, okay, I'm just going to just go for it and find a way and... Well, there was a lot of luck involved, yeah. as most of my life is, and I, I had to move from the country back to the city and do some things that weren't, you know, my dream jobs necessarily, mm -hmm. and, then, and then found a, a, a job with, through a friend that was uh, afforded me able to save up and go to Peru. Um, once you get there, the hard part is getting there. Once you get there, it's very cheap. It's very affordable to get around there. Right. Um, but getting there was, yeah, it was, and I'm not a world traveler. I'd never been anywhere outside of North America before this. Um, my father won't even fly. So wow. you know, I'm not a world traveler or anything. So for me just to pack up and go to the jungle, it was a, it was truly an adventure of a lifetime. That's amazing. Were you like nervous at all? Like before, I mean, that's... I'm very nervous. People oh, yeah. always ask, do you have to get shots? Did you get tetanus shots? All this stuff. And you know, no, I mean, I, I was going on after meeting Peter and knowing his extensive knowledge and reading his books. I was very comfortable with going, you know, to the jungle with him because I knew that you were going to be protected through him, through not only him but his whole team of people that you see in the documentary that help the guest. Right. So maybe we should maybe I should explain a little bit of what what he does. So he takes yeah. people, mostly uh, Americans, but Western, you know, of, of Europeans, Australians, people from all over the world, come on his trips, and he takes people to the jungle to Iquitos, Peru, and. Gives, gives them an opportunity to see what it's like to live in the jungle for a week. So you take a boat from Iquitos, 12 hours, a big river boat, and you're going 
down the Rio Ukulele or up the Rio Ukulele River, I should say, because you're in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. It always confuses me. But um, so you're getting really to the heart of what it's like to live in the jungle and how these people survive. And yes, it's spiritual medicine, but at the same time, these are real life medicines that they use to, you know, heal themselves. That they've been using for thousands of years. Thousands of years, you know, and, and, and then you talk about the indigenous people that Peter has befriended, the Matsez, which are the jaguar people, which tattoo their faces to look like jaguars. They're about 5'5 five, five, um, and carry spears that, you know, are over six foot tall. Wow. You know, so they're they're really intimidated. The first time I saw Mott says, I was like, "Wow, this is this is intense. This is real. <laughs> this right. is really the jungle." But these people, you know, when Peter first met them back in the mid '80s, they didn't even wear clothes and no shoes, and they were using some of these medicines like Sapo and Nunu as as hunting instruments, as hunting tools. So when people say, why would they, I mean, these were life and death. If they don't hunt well, if they don't provide food for their family, there's oh, yeah. no grocery stores in the jungle. It's, you know, life or death medicine. So they would take these medicines like Sapo and Nunu and go out in the jungle and hunt at night. Wow. So does it, in, you know, it, it heightens all your senses and increases your visual acuity, which means you can see further and longer distances. It increases your hearing, your, your total sense of sound. It does so many things. Maybe I should explain what Sapo is. To yeah, let's talk about never that. Heard about Sapo? Yeah. I've never heard about Sapo. Yeah. So yeah. Sapo is a frog. Is a medicine from the Phyomedusa bicolor tree frog, which is a frog you'll see in the documentary, and it's the opening scene of my film. So I try to explain what it is and what it does, and and why people would use it. Um, as far as the Mott says, again, they're taking this out before they go on a hunt. So they take the frog. They don't kill the frog. The frog survives. I, I kind of equate it to like milking a cow. You know, it's like the frog may be a little uncomfortable, but the frog kind of knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they, they go out at night and they call the frog. The frog calls back and they narrow down where the frog is up in a tree. They climb 50 feet up in a tree at night. Wow. And it's a pretty, and I've documented this in the film as well, but it's a pretty intense, you know, experience the first time you do it. I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, at <laughs> night and you're in a small little pecky pecky, which is a small little wooden canoe yeah. and you're paddling along and they're calling this frog and you're hearing all kinds of sounds. It's very, it's real. I mean, you realize this is the jungle and I'm here uh -huh. and there's, you know, what's going to jump out of the, the water next, you know? So, uh, but they take the frog back uh, to the camp and then they tie the frog to four sticks. You know, they take each of its legs and, and stretch it out and stick a small stick up its nose. And this uh, secretion, this frog secretes this solution on its back. Now, the reason the frog has it, it's a defense mechanism. So if an anacon anaconda or something eats it, it's going to secrete this solution and it's going to, the animal is going to spit it out. The predator is going to spit it out. So when it starts secreting this, the matzahs or whoever's collecting medicine will take a small stick and scrape it up and put it on another particular type of wood, wooden mm -hmm. stick, and it, and it dries, kind of like, like glue or mm -hmm. something is, is how you uh, would use it. They then, if you're going to apply it to someone, they'll take a small vine and burn the outer layer of your skin. And just to make sure that the medicine will apply quicker okay. to you know, the human body so it doesn't fall off. Um, uh, they use human saliva to mix with the sapo, the, the secretion, to make a paste. Okay. The, yeah. Spit and stir. Spit and stir. Spit <laughs> and stir, which sounds kind of gross to a lot of Westerners, but when you're in the jungle, you realize they use saliva for all kinds of different medicines and, right. and jungle drinks like Masato and different things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's a very common thing for us, for them to use that. Right. They found out that the, you know, the chemicals, the peptides in the human uh, saliva actually activate the chemicals in the sapo, wow, which cool. make it stronger and you know better for the body to you know absorb. So, and what does the sapo do? So why would you? The use sapo something does a like lot that? of things, and and yeah. I'm not a scientist, and I'm not a doctor, so I, you know I get a lot of these terms wrong and confused, and I can't pronounce a lot of these peptides, these chemicals within the sapo. But basically, they you know they do a lot of things. They clean your liver, your lungs. A, a lot of uh, detoxifying, you know, it's going to sharpen your brain, your mind, you know, clear your body of negative energy, 
There's a lot of things. I mean, I mean, I, I've never talked about this before, but my own mother, you know, was just saved by Sapo. She was down to 105 pounds, you know, a few months ago. And what was going on with her? Uh, gastronomical issues. Again, she went to. She's she's had some issues uh, over the last few years with a carcinoid tumor, and through that's had some other issues. And they're not even specifically sure what this last case was this last summer, but no doctors could give her any answers. I mean, she came to the best cancer doctors in Dallas Fort Worth and the only thing they wanted to do was cut her open and cut out her intestines. So through desperation and, and through knowing that I'd been going to the jungle for the last three years and working with these medicines and seeing what they're doing, she did Sapo and instantly, I mean some of her symptoms were excessive diarrhea, excessive vomiting, you know, acid reflux every night. Oh, you know, wow. she hadn't slept in eight weeks. So it was, you know, a very serious yeah. issue. So, and then also you keep losing weight like that. That's not a right. good idea. Uh. But, you know, it wouldn't, I wouldn't say like she did it one time and it cured her, but it, it stopped that. And then through, you know, successful treatment, she's gotten better and better and is over 120 pounds now. So. Oh, well, that's excellent. And then right. no surgery. No surgery. No surgery. Uh, there's another lady I know from Fort Worth who has been taking chemotherapy on a, a long-term program to stop a progressive breast cancer issue. And one of the byproducts of that is joint pain joint pain to the, to the point where you can't get out of bed or you can't get out of, out of a chair. Or she was a gardener. She couldn't get down and water her plants. In the same way, one of her friends had been on Peter Gorman's trip and knew about Sapo. And then, you know, she started doing Sapo. And within two months, she was back to walking three miles a day. Wow. And just doing amazing, you know, back to watering her plants again and being able to move and get out of bed and not being in constant pain and agony, you know. So it's... Wow. And is there, and there are any known side effects to that, do you know? Well, yeah, there, just like anything. And, and part of the thing is I'm not going out and telling everybody to do this. And I'm not going out and saying, hey, you can, you know, cure everything with this. The problem is there's not been enough research and there's not been enough knowledge of this. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there about the stuff. And, you know, Peter is the one that, you know, is, is kind of brought this stuff out to, the, you know, to the, the Western world. And it's kind of taken on a life of its own. But I think more and more people are learning about this every day, and that's one of the cool things about this documentary is we're able to get the word out and let people know that there are answers out there and there are hope, you mm -hmm. know, for maybe whatever may be ailing someone in your life. You know? Yeah, and if it's you know, and you know, just works like that, just try it and see what happens. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's exciting. It, it's exciting. Um, this right here, this Unadagato, this is this is cat's claw. This is another thing that I, that I that Peter talks about on his trip. Yeah. So what about, about what about time. that? What's cat's so, claw? So uh, Unadagato or cat's claw. Show it here. It, it's a vine Whoa. that that you basically take and brew a tea out of it. And I take it every day. I think it's it's excellent for building your immune system, especially as we get up to flu season and yeah. stuff like that. It's something very excellent to take, you know, for anti-inflammatory issues. And there, this is one of the things that has been researched extensively, cat's claw. There's tons of information on cat's claw. Just Google it, and you can find all kinds of information about it, and it's amazing. Uh, another thing that we have here is Sasha Hergon, which is another herb, and we talk about this in my documentary as well, that is great for reducing tumors. And people, if you make it, you add it to the tea. And um, it, it's excellent for doing anti-cancer nice. stuff like that. So there's a lot of information. And every time I go to Peru, I'm finding something new that I'd never heard of before. It's just a really magical, special place. So when you went there, like the first time, you mm -hmm. go down with Peter. What is kind of the most, like, what, if you could, like, narrow it down to, like, one experience or maybe just one you want to talk mm -hmm. about that you're like, well, this happened and this was so cool because I saw it live, something interesting. Uh, I mean, it's really like stepping into another world, another dimension when you go to Iquitos. So uh, Iquitos, for those who don't know, is basically the beginning of the Amazon River. So this is this jungle town that just propped up, you know, after years of, of people coming there and, and doing trading with all the indigenous people there. And the city popped up and it's just a really weird, eccentric place. I mean, you'll see guys, you know, juggling machetes in the street in the middle of traffic. Oh, interesting. And, I mean, yeah, just, I mean, watch out. <laughs> right, I mean, it, it is. And, and you'll, you, there's just really nothing that you may not, you know, it, there's nothing will shock you when you're walking down the street there. I mean, it's just, it, it really is like a fantasy world and it's beautiful and, and colorful and the people are amazing. And 
for me, when I landed in Peru, it was like um, you feel the spirit. I mean, people there believe in magic, you know, and they believe that magic is real. And I think that's the biggest difference. We'll say, what's the difference between here and Peru? And I'm like, the belief in the spirit and the belief in the magic is, is stronger in Peru, and you feel it there the minute you step foot on the ground. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, there's lots of people that have done research on the biology of belief, like Bruce Lipton's mm -hmm. one of them that talks about the, you know, it's, you know, not you just can't believe you're going to be like six foot tall if you're not, like not beyond right. the physical realm, but believing in things does change things too, really. So I like that. I believe in magic too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. So let's see what else uh, that I wanted to ask. Uh, hold on, my thing went blank. Da -da 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 -da. So um, why do you think it's so important to bring stuff like this out to light. I mean, you obviously have some personal experience, mm -hmm. watched your mom completely change, like from one thing, symptom reduction, and then now gaining weight, doing better, another friend, tumor reducing. You know, why is it important that we do know about stuff well, like this? Well, I think because we have been cornered into this medical world that we're now facing of people, it's almost like um, you know, and I've, I've seen this and I've witnessed it firsthand going through what my, my mother's been through is it's all about the money and it's about the, you know, bottom dollar. And why aren't the doctors talking about cat's claw? Well, because it's going to cost $5 a year right. for a supply. They can't have a second home in Colorado if they're selling you $5 cat's claw, you know, so, right. I mean, I'm not saying every doctor's like that, but you know, I mean, it's the mentality of the world. Let's give them these really expensive pharmaceuticals. I mean, look what they're doing with veterans and soldiers with PTSD, and they've got them on so many prescriptions mm -hmm. that for most people, they don't work. Yeah, or they just have another side effect. And then right. truth is told, there's a lot of things that we sell here that are way priced way higher than they are in any other country in this world, because mm -hmm. gotcha. <laughs> right. And then they want to pin you in a little bit of a corner of like, ooh, do this, you die. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I think what this stuff is, I'm not, you know, I'm not here to say it's a cure all or everybody should do it or it's for everybody, but it's, it's an alternative. It's a message of hope of people that, you know, if you haven't tried it, maybe you should try it. Maybe it's for you. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's for someone, you know, in your life that has tried everything else in the world and nothing works. Yeah. So how has this changed you? Like in, okay, so one person, so you said you're an alcoholic for 17 years mm -hmm. and what all that kind of just does for your life and clouds it and then found healing in that. And then to come from a small town and then come back out, you know, <laughs> what is just, or have you sort of always been a little bit that way? And this just like kind of puts you over the edge. No, no, it's, it's changed my life in, in, in every facet, you know, maybe bringing out some of what I was always true and what was always there, but I was too scared to show. And, you know, it's, it's given me, I guess, fear, you know, overcoming fear is the number one thing is I tell people is a lot of these, these medicines is overcoming the fear of not being the best that you can be and just in letting fear control your life. And that's one of the things that I've learned through this is just to be fearless, to, you know, don't be scared of, of chasing your dreams and making your dreams come true, you know, and. At the time, I didn't know, but like being from a really small town has really helped because it's like I've always been an underdog my whole life, you know. So it's been it's been fun to come out and being able to talk about this after doing working on this stuff for three years, you know, kind of being in my hole and just doing it. And now it's like getting the word out and letting people know about, hey, these these medicines have helped me. They've helped my friend, my friends, my family. You know, do the research. Do you know? Don't listen to any one particular person. Go out and do the research yourself. Go to Peru. You know, find out about Peter Gorman. Read his books. You know. Yeah, very, very cool. And so, um, you know, what's I guess what else do we want people to sort of know about about Peter and this work? And then, um, and then we'll go more a little bit into the film and what what all people can expect from that. Yeah, I, I mean, for, for me, I would say that that. Peter's just a regular guy. He's a working class, you know, Joe. He's no one special, um, and he'll tell you that himself. But he, he's just went there, and he's done the work, and he's been going there for 35 years. You know, he's, his wife is Peruvian. He's raised Peruvian kids. He, he knows the culture better than any gringo can, really. I mean, he's he's... He's done the work, and I would say that's why people need to, you know, read his books and, and watch this movie and and know that, 
you know, there are things out there that we may not know them about them one day, and they find out the next day they may be the answers to everything we've always been searching for. Right, because those people have had it down there for thousands and thousands of years, and then somebody finds it and brings it out, and then people try and kind of keep going. Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like, you know, ask me how did this film get made. I mean, this film, you know, on paper shouldn't exist because um, – Taking it on, you know, we shot in Texas, we shot in California, and we shot in Peru with really no budget, no crew for the most part. And here we are, you know, we're, but I feel like the universe has wanted that message to get out. The universe has wanted people to know about these medicines. And this is, this is just a straightforward documentary. This is not one that we're trying to influence in people in way, one way or the other. I think it's more of an anthrop anthropological, if I can say that word study of of what's going on there right now and it's changed already since the stuff i've shot there now and it'll change more five years from now and even more 10 years from now that's really really cool and so how can people um you know so when they when they watch this what do you think they're going to walk away with kind of knowing um know? i hope when people you know see this film we just recently screened in, in los angeles uh, because we'd shot some of the film there last year, and I feel like we need to take it back there and, and capture some of that spirit that you feel when you're in L.A. And nice. You know what I'm talking about yeah. when you see it there. People are very aware of this medicines, of this work, of their abilities to heal and so forth there. So that was very cool, and the reception there was outstanding. I mean, people were really not knowing a whole lot about the project because we haven't put a lot out there. You know, we've kind of just been doing rough cut screenings here and there to – test the waters to see what the reception was to see like you know we've been watching it we think it's great yeah. but we're very biased so it's to put it out there with an audience of people that weren't necessarily your best friends or your family who are going to tell you it's great when it's really putting people to sleep but the reactions we've had so far has just been great i mean people are, are loving it and understanding that that uh, if you just put a camera on peter gorman that you're gonna capture something magical if you're in peru i mean it's just it's not, I'm not a cinematographer. I never claim, I hope I'm never one again, to be honest. <laughs> Maybe next time I can afford a crew, uh -huh. you know, on the next documentary. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's been fun. And uh, we're, we're, we've got a couple more screenings here in the works that we're going to do before the end of the year. One in Houston that's planned and one here hopefully in Dallas-Fort Worth. Nice. Well, I think um, Ziggy has um, the, a little YouTube clip maybe that we could show. Okay. And so he's going to put that up in a second here. And we'll see what's going on. Hello, my name is James Michael McCoy and I'm a filmmaker from Texas. For the past three years, I've been working on a documentary called More Joy, Less Pain. It's a film about a man named Peter Gorman, an adventure and writer who's been traveling to Peru for the past 35 years. I follow Peter as he navigated the two worlds in which he lives, a life in Peru and a life in Texas with his family. Traveling with Peter to the Amazon jungle was a childhood dream come true. Meeting the indigenous people called the Montsez was life changing and seeing the Fire Medusa bicolor tree frog was an otherworldly experience. Making this documentary has changed my life, but the process has also been the hardest thing I've ever done. If I've learned anything in making this film, it's that it's important to have a team behind you and that I cannot make films by myself. I've spent every dime that I've made the past three years on this film without any grants or private investors. And as we wrap up post-production with costs continuing to rise, we need help in covering some of those costs. I shot most of this film by myself, a crew of one. I went to the Amazon arm with only a cell phone and a selfie stick. And I wasn't totally convinced that this was going to be a good idea until I started looking at the footage when I got back to Texas. Ultimately, I took three trips with Peter to Peru, filming in Iquitos in the jungle three times and taking one trip down to Cusco in the ancient city of Machu Picchu to do some interviews. In between those trips, I spent dozens and dozens of hours filming at Peter's home in Joshua, Texas. Altogether, I shot over 400 hours of footage, which was eventually cut down to an hour and 45 minute film. My editor, Jeff McGee, coming on board is what got this film made. Jeff and I worked on editing this film every Monday night for a year and a half before we got to our first rough cut. At the moment, we're in the final stages of post-production for sound design and color correction. We are just starting the process of entering film festivals, and we're asking for your help to get more joy, less pain out to the world. It really feels like when you're there, and especially when you're in ceremony, that it's, it's the middle of the universe. 
I'm asking you to take an investment in me and more joy and less pain. I'm doing this GoFundMe campaign to help with finishing funds for the film. We are offering pre-order digital downloads of the film. There are also other incentives like naming the credits, copies of signed books, and other producer opportunities. Please check out the GoFundMe page and donate if you can. Your positive energy will be gladly accepted as well. Please help us help the world by spreading more joy and less pain. Thank you. He seems to know more about this than anybody else. He's the only white person to have any information firsthand about it. Okay, you shot that on a cell phone. <laughs> I'm so impressed. Yeah. I mean, wow, that was cool. Just from like that stuff there, cell phone. Yeah, I wasn't totally convinced this was going to be a good idea. Well, it looks know? good. <laughs> it looks really, <laughs> well, until really good. Until I got back, you know, a friend of mine had mentioned that, you know, I was contemplating, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to camera? I can't rent a camera. I can't, uh -huh. I can't buy a camera. And he's like, shoot on a cell phone. And I'm like, eh, I don't know about that. I, you know, I want this to look professional. I want this to look good. Uh -huh. And he's like, no. And I, and I started looking at, uh, you know, some, I went on the website and looked at the, the footage and I was like, uh, okay, maybe I can use the phone. And I wasn't totally convinced. I went on the trip and I filmed everything. And then I, knew, I thought I was getting really good stuff. And when I brought it back, I was looking at it going, wow, this is, this is totally incredible. I, I mean, I, I have a little bit of background with um, knowing people who have made this before. I mean, one of my mentors, a guy I really look up to is a filmmaker, LM Kit Carson. He made a cell phone documentary when cell phone cameras first came out, back when Nokia oh. was, you know, hot thing or the best cell phone uh -huh. you could get before the iPhone. Yeah. So he had got commissioned through the Sundance uh, Institute with Robert Redford and went to Africa and that Nokia to, to let him use the phone and wow. film this little six, I think six part series on like 15 little minute, you know, short documentary. Um, episodes uh called uh africa sure i'm well, now i'm africa diary sorry okay, i'm cool. there for a second but africa diary so i you know was i knew that it was possible you know so he kind of led the the groundwork on doing that so you know, i wasn't totally convinced till i got back and looked at it but uh, and now it. the phones are way better the, yeah or camera phone whatever someone's right. called my camera <laughs> and i'm hoping you know for me what i would like to see out of this is just inspire people to say, I mean, I wasn't a documentary filmmaker. Yeah, I mean, I've been trying to get films made, but still, it's just, just document it. Just do something. Just, you know, we can all be filmmakers with what we have today. Yeah, I mean, and tell a story of somebody yeah. that, like, and I've never heard of it, but obviously a well-known person. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, if he's writing for High Times, has books out, you know, well-known to a right. lot of people, but not to everybody. But to spread this message that, you know, one, just like your story of yourself, okay, $100 to your name, I'm just going to go for it which takes really a lot of courage, you know, to just say, because you could just be there and be like, oh, no, I don't know, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, it's not going to work. The million things that your mind could go through of no, and why you just said, no, I'm going to just try and go yes. And then, huh, here you are now. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. sometimes you get lucky, they say. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, then I guess if you believe in luck, it will find you, right? right. Or you find it. Yeah. So now... Um, Tell me where, if people want to see, they want to see this movie, you, we just showed the video, like, mm -hmm. how to go fund me. How can they support you, see it, get the message around? Yeah, I mean, we're on Facebook, you know, More Joy, Less Pain. YouTube, More Joy, Less Pain. Uh, we do have a GoFundMe. Uh, we just hit our goal this last week. You know, we, we hit our uh, fundraising goal, and we're continuing to raise money. Basically, the more money we have, the more places we can take this film, the more places that we can get the word out about More Joy, Less Pain. So every dollar we get will go towards, you know, making that a reality uh, and just keep up with us on there, you know, and, and my, I'm under Facebook under James Michael McCoy. So you look me up on there and. Cool. Let me ask you, where did you come up with that name? More joy, less pain. I, I can't take credit for that. That's wow. Peter's mantra. That's kind of what he lives his life. And he's got a whole story that I, I would tell, but I don't want to tell it because I mess it up about okay. where he came up with that name and, and, uh, he let me use it. You know, it was great. And I like it. Yeah, he's like, I didn't want to sit there and have to worry about, oh, the Peter Gorman story. is like, more joy, less pain. Just uh -huh. just, and doesn't that sound good? I yeah. mean, right, because there's always going to be pain and suffering in this world, and you can interject, you know, 
your situation, things you can't change, but can probably throw some more joy into it. Yeah, it's like, how do you want to live your life? How do you want to look at the world? Do you want, you know, to look at all the bad stuff or you want to look at all the really good stuff that's happening every day? Yeah, you know, that's right. Because there's always more good stuff, I think. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like the, uh, if you look back on your life, you can picture every bad thing or you can picture every good thing. Like there's no sports athlete that's like shows their highlight reel of all their bloopers. No, it's all the best running through, you know, whatever the best of. And if we thought about that, what are all the best things or just finding joy somewhere? How cool would that be? Right. And how inspiring this is <laughs> that there's always more that you can do. Is there anything else that you want to share with our audience that we didn't talk about? Um, you know, th th we're working and we just started development on the next documentary. Uh, we're working on a documentary on High Times Magazine. Cool. And what's that going to be about? Well, you know, through the course of making this documentary, there was a ton of stories about High Times, of course, for Peter working for him for 12 years. And, and there was just not really room to include a lot of that stuff. Uh, through, you know, through that, though, I realized that, that would be really great. Everybody's got a high type story. I mean, somehow everyone from college, somewhere, we used to get that I mean, magazine. That was, and yeah, exactly. Yeah. Back then, there wasn't uh -huh. social media. So you got your cannabis information through High Times Magazine. And, and just talking to people, I realized that th this is a story that generates, you know, w with a lot of individuals out there. And, and, and basically the idea of it behind it is, is how cannabis culture was changed by a magazine. You know, right. in America, Peter was writing about this stuff in 1986 when he got hired by High Times. You know, his editor told him, "Peter, your number one job is to make medical marijuana a worldwide issue." Wow! And he started writing about this when everyone thought it would never happen. And then look how far we're coming up. Right. Got somebody still battling, but the plant that grows yeah. in the ground that doesn't kill people like alcohol does, right. or the other legal things that are out there. And, and all the same things that apply with what I talked about the medicines in this documentary apply to that as well. As well, it's still ridiculous that we're stopping veterans, we're stopping seniors, we're stopping people with chronic pain and illnesses from reaching healing. Reaching, and having a way better quality of life. Right. And that just the ripple effect that that has. Because if you know, like even I'm sure like if we take example of your mom or somebody or even, you know, mm -hmm. anybody that's ill, like it takes you down and then people have to help you otherwise and it affects the people around you. And then when you're healthy and well and healing, then it just all kind of blossoms like that. Yeah. More joy, less pain. <laughs> right. There we go. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you just so very much for being on. You can find James Michael McCoy and More Joy, Less Pain on Facebook. You can look up his GoFundMe. And for everyone out there listening, you know there is always another way.